When the first nomadic humans traveled west of the world's edge mountains to the lands that would become the Empire. They did so escaping the vast hordes of savage greenskins that were running rampant. Many thousands of humans, divided in tribes, migrated west to start a new life. One of those tribes, the Bretoni, traveled further and crossed the Grey Mountains, settling in those lands, giving them their own name. Being a tribe forged in war and with strong people, they got rid of the greenskins that had managed to reach those territories. And soon, the Bretoni became the dominant culture beyond the Grey Mountains. The highly independent warlords of the Bretoni lands refused to unite with the Empire, after an invitation from Sigmar was rejected due to having many differences in their core society values. The Bretoni folk had a culture that revolved around chivalry, honor, social birthright, nobility, and pride. They would not accept Sigmar as their leader, as he was a foreigner to them. In the year 770 of the Imperial Calendar, Bretonia was far from being united, weakened by its divisions, Sixteen different dukedoms had been formed since the first humans settled there. The Greenskins had been multiplying in numbers for many years at this point. When the men of Bretonia started to notice the growing threat, it was too late. The many invasions and raids began to grow in intensity. It took 160 more years for the threat to fully materialize, but once it did, it seemed unstoppable. A massive horde of orcs emerged with an unstoppable fury and began to quickly overrun the lands of Kulu. After some valiant resistance, every last one of the knights of Kulu was killed in battle and only did the united armies of Kinel and Brion stop the orc invasion, but they failed to strike at the source of the threat. The orc armies soon returned, and by the year 948 IC, a deluge of green warriors was drowning Bretonia in violence and destruction. The northern lands were being overrun by Norskan raiders attacking the coasts. The lords and dukes in the north had to take shelter within their castles while their lands were being pillaged and burned. Greenskins were running rampant again on apparently all sides. Beastmen hordes emerged from the forest of Arden. And the armies of the undead were arriving from the west in their skeletal warships, bringing death and desolation with them. Any attempts at resistance failed, as the fragmented knights were destroyed one by one by the encroaching enemy. All seemed lost. It was some time between the years 974 and 977 of the Imperial Calendar that a much-needed leader emerged. Somebody to unite the desperate men of Bretonia against their foes and towards their liberation. Known as Gilles Le Breton, 
He was already famous for slaying Smirgus, a great red worm the size of a castle that swallowed horses whole. Gilles was joined under a common banner by the Dukes of Lyonnais and Moussillon. Initially, they offered resistance, but soon they realized that their efforts were in vain, as even their united armies were being overwhelmed by the orcs. A change in the tide came when the Bretoni host camped beside a lake, attempting to rest before a seemingly inevitable battle against a far larger greenskin force. When Gilles was drawing water to drink, it is said that a young, ghostly woman appeared, with porcelain skin and fair hair covered by a white veil, looking like a blessing sent from the heavens. Stunned by the vision and driven by desperation, Gilles grabbed and raised the tattered and bloodied banner of his host, crying out, Lady, wouldst thou bless mine banner? As he dipped it into the lake's waters, its textiles repaired and its colors and shape shifted. Amazed, he raised it to show the miracle to his men. The pristine glowing banner was now decorated with an icon of a golden chalice. The apparition was indeed the Lady of the Lake. Purity, nobility, and courage personified. The men follow Gilles' example. They all dip their weapons in the water, asking the mysterious lady of the lake for her blessing, even leading their horses into the waters for the animals to also be enchanted before the battle. The beautiful lady granted them all her boon, and lastly produced the very chalice. As miraculously as she emblazoned it onto the banner, and granted it to Gilles and his closest companions, the Dukes of Lyonnais and Moussillon, to drink from. As they drank, their strength was restored and their wounds healed. They have become saints amongst men, warriors amongst serfs, blessed beyond all men, and honored with a life of service to the Lady, the first three Grail Knights. Meanwhile, the green-skin Wa was drawing close. The lady blessed her armies, but she could not, or at least would not, slow time for them. Gilles' host assembled into formation and readied their ranks, and although the horizon was darkened with the enemy's numbers, the men's courage was unstained under the lady's blessing. They rode forward to meet the orcs, arrows falling everywhere around them, but miraculously missing the soldiers themselves. Their horses turned to gallop as the Greenskins drew near, and the Bretoni cavalry smashed into the enemy's ranks.
green infantry was trampled beneath their hooves, routed, slashed, and speared as they rode on. Rank after rank after rank. The impetus of the charge was seemingly unending. The host of Pretonia was impregnable to the weapons of the orcs, as any greenskin within an arm's length of the human soldiers quickly fell to the ground, lifeless or wounded. Seeing their companions routing, overwhelmed by the momentum of the charge, or perhaps simply realizing further resistance was pointless, the Greenskin's army scattered entirely. The orcs ran and screamed in anger and fear, not able to fully comprehend what had happened to the knights. The battle dragged on for hours. It lasted until sunset. It was bloody. But it was won by the Bretoni. Following the battle and back in camp, the knights accompanying Geo made their vows to the Lady of the Lake, swearing to honor and serve her. With this act, they have been rendered immune to the fell powers of chaos, as the belief in the nobility of the Lady's cause gave them an armor of virtue, one that cannot be pierced by neither spear nor arrow. As a host bound together under one vow, they set out to free Bretonia from occupants once more. Now, in the name of the Lady. The Grail Knights have become feared by their enemies, and esteemed by all men. As their leader went on to free Bretonia under the glowing banner of the Grail, bestowed upon Bretonia by the Lady. Jeel emerged in the darkest days of the lands of the Bretoni and gathered other dukes to fight alongside him. Blessed by the Lady of the Lake, the Grail Knights fought a massive greenskin horde and won an important victory. The triumph over the massive orc army was a beacon of new light and hope in a time where the Bretoni folk stood at the border of total collapse. There were still thousands upon thousands of enemies running uncontrollably all over their lands. Norsken raiders still pillaged and burned across the entire northern region of the lands west of the Grey Mountains. Beastmen were pouring out of the forest of Arden in numbers beyond counting. While undead legions were advancing, in a sepulchral march of silent death, leaving only desolation in their wake. These were the darkest of days. But Gilles, with the help of the Dukes of Lioness and Moussillon, now turned into saints by the blessing of the Lady, had already won the first great battle. After the Greenskin's defeat, the plains were soaked in blood, and only a few orcs had managed to escape the unrelenting fury of the newly blessed Grail Knights. With that victory, the Dukes of Borderlow and Aquitaine joined Giel and his knights in a campaign to free their own lands and the other dukedoms from the numerous invading enemies. Just after the victory feast, the Lady appeared in front of the five knights in their private chambers and gave them the Holy Grail. There were now five blessed Grail Knights. The following morning, the five knights and their respective armies marched south, down through the coast until reaching Brion.
They arrived at the rear of a massive horde of orcs and goblins that were led by an orc war boss riding a giant wyvern. Without hesitating, they charged. You are the ladies' man, and no beast will stop you. The knights fought with all their might. The orc warlord and his wyvern were struck down. And with their leader slain, the remaining horde of orcs ran for their lives. Atop their horses, the Protoni delivered swift retribution to the escaping enemies. Thus, the second great battle was won. But it was not over. With haste and their morale high, the armies continued towards the besieged capital of Brion. It is said that the Greenskins outnumbered the Knights 15 to 1 when they arrived. But that didn't stop them from sounding the battle horns and charging forwards once again. The ground shook as they advanced. Lord Balduin of Brienne sallied forth with the last of his knights. During the chaotic battle that followed, a giant axe was stuck in the Valiant Knight's shield and stayed there for the entire fight. The orcs were being slaughtered from all sides, and eventually, the forces of the Lord of Brion met with Gilles' knights in the middle of the battlefield, where hundreds of greenskins perished with each passing second. Now, with me, companions! During their meeting, the lady appeared and bestowed her blessings upon Balduin, Lord of Brion. With the armies of greenskins dispersed, the third great battle was won, and the sixth Grail Knight joined Gilles and the other saints in a united campaign of reclamation for their homelands. After those events, Gilles and his companions traveled east and crossed the river Brienne, guided by visions from the Lady. As they passed through the wasted lands of Carcassonne, Lord Lambert rallied to their side at the sight of the Banner of the Lady. They eventually reached Canel, only to find it besieged in the forest of Lorraine burning. Orcs and goblins everywhere. As they attacked the foul invaders, the battle turned into a bloody affair, as numerous goblins riding great wolves attacked the men atop their horses. Night after night they fought, the companions held true, and eventually reached the border of the burning forest, driving most goblins back. Despite being battle-worn and wounded, the divine blessing of the Lady flowed strong within them, and encouraged by Gilles Le Breton, they charged into that living hell. The fight inside the forest was chaotic and violent, with the flames soaring high. In the middle of the battlefield, the Fey Enchantress of the Forest of Lorraine emerged to aid the Knights. The forest spirits became living weapons, and with the combined forces of the Knights and the host of the forest, they defeated the orcs and goblins after a long night of blood and fire. When the battle ended, the Lady gave her boon to the Dukes of Carcassonne and Canel, turning them into the seventh and eighth Grail Knights. The fourth great battle had been won, and from that day, Gilles established strong bonds with the Fey Enchantress of the neighboring forest. 
The eight Grail Knights rode north after a night of rest. Their bodies rejuvenated and their wounds healed. The Lady's blessing granting them superhuman vigor and elevating them into unstoppable weapons of retribution. After seven long days of travel, they reached the capital city of Paravon. The city was in ruins, as goblins were running rampant in the streets, while enormous boulders and rocks were being smashed into the city walls by monstrous giants atop the hills overlooking the city. The Lord of Paravon, mounted on top of his mighty Pegasus, took the fight to the giants and aided Shiel and his companions in the battle that followed to retake the city. The bodies of hundreds upon hundreds of orcs and goblins were hurled into the fires as the battle ended. The blood of the Greenskins tainted the streets, and the once beautiful city was destroyed. But it was finally recovered. The fifth great battle had been won. The campaign continued with the knights traveling northwest towards Monfall. The lands of the Bretoni were still plagued with monsters and serious threats to the survival of their race. When they arrived, the city of Monfall was under heavy siege. A terrible flood of night goblins was pouring from Axemite Pass and against the castle. Their numbers seemed endless. With a valiant charge, the knights struck deep into their lines, causing heavy casualties. Suddenly, Gilles was wounded by a rusty bolt, cowardly thrown from one of the Greenskin's diabolical war machines. Gilles Le Breton fell from his mount, with the bolt struck deep in his chest. The plan had gone south, and the Grail champions had no option but to take Gilles' body and fight their way into the besieged castle. A night that seemed eternal ensued. Gilles was gravely wounded and in agony, tended by surgeons who went back and forth, whispering among themselves with evident preoccupation. The companion knights were debating what course of action to take next. The first Grail Knight was not meant to survive that night, but what happened next can only be described as a miracle. If the legends are to be believed, then the lady was within Giel. And as dawn broke, the fallen hero did grasp the shaft of the bolt, and with a great roar, pulled it from his chest where light streamed out. For the courage shown, the lady blessed the Duke Simon Fall in Paravon, making them the ninth and tenth Grail Knights to be blessed with a drink from the Holy Grail at this point. Like a heavenly warrior, Gilles rode out and led the charge once more, inspiring all around them in killing three giant wyverns in the process. One of them was taken down with the very same bolt that had wounded him. The massive horde of goblins coming out of the caves continued to emerge incessantly. The battle dragged on for an entire week of fighting without stopping. The Bretoni were suffering casualties, but for every man slain, uncountable goblins fell. Finally, after much fighting, the Saint Knights proved to be unkillable under the blessings of divine power, and the goblins' will to fight broke as they retreated back into the mountains. The sixth great battle had been won. The goblins were retreating in a chaotic stream back into the depths of the mountains. Gilles would not let them escape, and he ordered the pursuit of the coward creatures. The knights headed straight into the everlasting darkness of the caves. The valiant Grail knights fought their way deeper and deeper, descending through the vast network of caves and passages of the Grey Mountains, 
all infested with trolls and goblins. The only light visible was the fire radiating from their blessed weapons. We must proceed more carefully. They are fast and deceptively cunning. But you are the ladies' man, and no beast will stop you. Eventually, they reached the chambers of the Goblin Kings, and they attacked. Soon after, the Knights nailed the Goblin Kings onto their lances, and fought their way back to the surface. Guided by the divine light of their weapons, and causing havoc amongst the leaderless goblins, who quickly dispersed and ran for their lives. Thus, the seventh great battle had been won. Being ten Grail Knights blessed by the Lady, the Companions rode north, where they were joined by the Lord of Jizero, the land they were traveling to. What they found this time was a little bit different. The sneaky goblins had called upon shamans from different tribes to summon the devastating spells of their foul god. On the battlefield, the winds howled and shifted, materializing into what seemed to be the fury of the Greenskin's gods themselves. But the knights were unspoiled, as no dark magic can harm those under the auspice of the powerful lady. It is said that Lord Baldwin beheaded a dozen goblin shamans with a single sweep of his axe. Giel and his companions had won the eighth great battle, after tens of thousands of greenskins were swiftly struck down. The next morning, the knights departed once again, this time heading towards the west and following the river until reaching Moussillon. As they approached, they saw with remorse how those lands had been turned into a black wasteland. Cattle lay dead everywhere, and the stench of death impregnated the air. They rode in grim silence through the gates of the city to reunite with their allies there. Folgar, the neighboring lord of Artois, had grim news. A great host of beastmen and undead were marching towards them, and there was no time to lose. Companions! Bretonia's need is dire! This terrible fog corrodes our focus! Our enemy, a horde of horrifying beasts, thrives in this gloom, so be on your guard! The battle that followed was hard fought. Gilles himself managed to behead a giant drake. Viofu, Lord of Lioness, wrestled with a two-headed giant. In the skies above, Azilgar, Lord of Parovan, 
fought atop his mighty Pegasus against a host of flying mutant bats. Every companion was pushed to their limits as they fought immense beasts or powerful enemy champions. The battle was only won when Landuin struck down the necromancer that had raised the dead from their tombs. The animated bodies of the dead crumbled to the ground, with no magic to sustain them, and the beastmen were terrified by the sight of their allies falling apart, and the knights fighting as mighty gods of war. The filthy creatures howled and screamed their way back into the darkness of the forest of Arden, trying to escape total annihilation. They failed. The knights followed them, and most were killed. When they returned, the Dukes of Artois and Gizero shined with the light of the Lady, thus becoming the 11th and 12th Grail Knights. The ninth great battle had ended. Their next destination would be the city of Langil to the north. The champions rode forth, going through the forest of Arden. Under the shade of the trees, many days passed, as Gilles and the Grail Knights headed north. Upon emerging from the other side of the forest, they reached their destination. The port city was completely surrounded by the barbaric tribes that had descended from Norska and beyond. Crude men wearing fur as clothes and skulls as trophies. The savage animals screamed and demanded blood for their foul gods. Cordwin, the lord of the troubled city of Langil, joined the fight with renewed forces at the sight of Gilles and his army. With a charge that made the very air roar, the knights cut through the Norskin raiders like scythes, reaping wheat and a truly barbaric fight ensued. The Grail Knights fought with all their might as their enemies returned their blows in kind. The Bretoni Knights were driven by honor, courage, and faith in their lady, while the Northern Warriors, driven by pride, sought glory in the eyes of their gods. Thousands of barbarians were driven into the water, but that did not stop them. They just kept coming fighting like truly unleashed savages. In the middle of the carnage, Marcus of Bordelow challenged the barbarian leader to single combat. Find victory or take leave, he shouted. Being too prideful to refuse the challenge, both armies agreed that the victor would get to stay in those lands and the loser would have to leave immediately. It was atop the towering lighthouse of the city that the two warriors met in combat. The giant barbarian fought wielding two massive hammers, which were already tainted with the blood of many Bretonic. A violent storm fell upon the place as the two men fought. The night fell and there was still no winner. Both warriors fought with all their might as the sounds of clashing steel could be heard by all men watching below them. The dark night gave place to the sunlight, and still they fought. Bloodied and tired, both warriors spared no inch of ground, as they knew the fate of their people would be decided atop that tower. Many more hours passed, until Marcus opened his foe's guard, and with one decisive blow, his blade, driven by the faith of the lady, struck the towering warrior with a force that split the giant in two and sent him falling against the rocks below. The Norskin warriors honored their deal and retreated back north, sailing back to their cold and icy homelands. The Tenth Great Battle, a savage war that raged for night and day, had been won. After one night of rest, the knights resumed their journey, now towards Kuron. The Duke of those lands met Gilles and his men with dire news. Another massive horde of Greenskins were advancing towards them, heading to Langil. The Bretoni would meet them in battle with their banners raised high and their energies renewed. We will 
plunge our blades into their ignoble hearts and reclaim our birthright. The number of greenskins that were slain on that day is said to be beyond counting. The river Sani ran black with the blood of the greenskin race. To this day, the marks of that battle can still be seen, and the battlefield was forever left with the enormous mark of blood that quenched the earth of those lands. With the 11th Great Battle won, the Bloody Knights gathered in Kuron. On the plains of Kuron, Gilles and his companions fought the biggest battle of the campaign. From the forest of Arden started to emerge all types of beasts and creatures without name. It was as if the forest was vomiting repulsive beastmen hordes without stopping. As the knights prepared to face this threat, news arrived that a massive green-skinned horde was approaching, the largest they had ever seen in those lands. To make matters even worse, a Skaven army rose up from the depths of the city tunnels and sewers and began pillaging the streets. The Lady of the Lake appeared amongst the reunited knights before the final battle and gave the Dukes of Langil and Curon a drink from the Holy Grail. She then proceeded to bless the rest of the army. Fourteen Grail companions were now ready to go to war in the name of the Lady. What followed next was a battle for the ages. Attacked from all sides, the Grail Knights and their combined armies charged like a rolling thunder and fought for their survival. The earth would constantly shake and it seemed like it would crack open under the sheer weight of the thousands upon thousands of warriors. Should we fail today, Bretonia will be left vulnerable. The kingdom relies on us, so fight to defend all you hold dear! The battle lasted for weeks, and the martial skills, bonds of brotherhood, and courage of the now united dukes of those lands were tested. Knowing that the power of the lady flowed through them, they fought and fought without fear. They waged war like never before. As the days passed, the warriors lost count of how many weeks the battle lasted. But against all odds, the Grail Knights emerged victorious. The bodies of the vile creatures formed mountains of corpses that were put to the torch. The flames touched the sky and the dark smoke covered the skies for an entire season after the battle. This marked the end of the twelfth and final great battle of the campaign that Gilles and his companions fought to liberate their lands. With salvation finally achieved, all lords agreed to a common peace between their dukedoms. Bretonia was founded by Gilles de Breton, who was crowned as the first king of the newly established kingdom, and whom the Bretonians hold to be as renowned as Sigmar. The kingdom is now divided into 14 great dukedoms. From the fair Curon to the north, to the rugged land of Carcassonne to the south. Each of the powerful dukes commands an army of knights supported by squires and men-at-arms, drawn from the ranks of the commoners. Gilles continued to fight for their people whenever any enemies menaced the region. It was Gilles who established their military traditions for the centuries to come. Not necessarily free of obstacles and challenges, Britonia prospered greatly under his rule. After many years, he was struck down by a rage weapon shot by an unknown hand. This event marked the Britonians deeply 
as they despise any weapon that cowardly kills from afar. With his dying breath, Gilles asked to be taken to a nearby lake. There, atop a ghostly boat made of mists, Gilles' body was carried by the lady herself as he transcended to godhood. Thus passed the legend of Gilles de Breton, the uniter of Bretonia. Many leaders have ruled Bretonia ever since, the greatest of them being King Lewin Leonker, a mighty warrior and the current head of the kingdom. With sheer determination and an unshakable faith in the Lady of the Lake, the Bretoni continue to fight against the numerous threats that engulf their noble people and their beautiful homeland. and will continue to do so until the end times. On this channel, we are putting together narrative total war cinematic battles and Warhammer lore videos. A special thank you goes to our Patreon supporters who help us in the making of more content. You can also directly support the channel through Patreon, find the link in the description below. Make sure to subscribe and hit the notification button to be the first to watch the next video. Thank you for watching and see you on the next one.